please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. I'd like you to think about this question. Uh, is there anything in life that you would be willing to go to prison for? Kind of a rough start for a sermon on Mother's Day, you know? Um, <clears throat> maybe you'd go to prison for mom's sake. Maybe not. <laughs> no one's asking you to do that. But what if part of God's plan for you was to go to prison for him? Now, that's not a great church growth strategy. You know, hey, we invite you to come to church. Come follow Jesus, and you might get the opportunity to go to prison for him. We laugh, but this actually happens in many parts of the world, even today. You know, we sit here in Naples, and we go, how could that be part of God's plan? Well, look how our text today begins. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Okay, so Paul is writing this letter from Rome where he's under house arrest, waiting to stand trial before the Roman emperor to answer charges against him by the Jewish leaders back in Jerusalem. And these are charges directly related to his ministry given to him by God to preach the gospel to Gentiles, non-Jews. Paul actually knew that this would be part of God's plan if he chose to be faithful to the mission. How do we know that he knew? Acts chapter 20, 22 to 24. This is the end of his third missionary journey. He's on his way back to Jerusalem. He's, he meets with the elders and leaders of this church in Ephesus. They, they come to the coast, meet his ship. As he's on his way back, they actually try to discourage him from going back. And this is what Paul tells them. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Wow. But Paul says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So apparently, Paul knew this was going to come, but he also knew it was worth it. What if God told you this was part of his plan for you? I mean, would you just dive in full force? Uh, would you finish the race, complete the task? I imagine many of us would say, I'm not sure if it's worth it. Can I get a different assignment? You know, pick, send that guy. Um, here's what we often think. All right, if I sign up for this following Jesus thing, if I put him first in my life, if, if I say no to the pleasures of this world, I kind of expect that God's going to bless me. He's going to protect me, and he's going to provide for me. And even more so, if I sign up to go be a missionary, you know, um, our human side makes this sort of quid quo pro deal with God. It's a this for that deal. Okay, God, <clears throat> I'm going to serve you, but I'm trusting you to have my back if I do. We might not openly say that, but, but inside we, we subconsciously feel that. Notice Paul calls himself a 
prisoner of Christ Jesus or for Christ Jesus. Like, wait, Paul, I thought you were a prisoner of Caesar. But that's not how, how Paul saw it. And Paul is he's about to pray for them. That's what he's, he's trying to do here. He's going to get into it. And he's about to pray for them. But then he realizes, hey, wait a minute. The church there in Ephesus may see my imprisonment as an obstacle, uh, something they should feel sorry for me about. Um, you know, oh, what a bummer. Our star player, Paul, has been in prison for three to five years. What, what can we do for poor Paul? But look what Paul tells them in verse 13. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Paul's saying, guys, it's totally worth it for me to be here in prison for Jesus on your behalf. Suffering for Jesus so others can hear the gospel and believe it is worth it. So This is our big idea today. All right, it's, it's right here in the text. It's worth it to suffer for Jesus. How is obedience to Jesus in your life leading you to suffer in some way? I mean, is, is it? Is, is following Jesus obedience to him? You may not be in prison, but is it? leading to some suffering in your life. Until we understand and accept this truth, we will probably do everything in our power to actually avoid suffering. We will probably see suffering and persecution as a sign of, I must be outside the will of God. And Why else would I be suffering here? God must be sending me a message, I'm in the wrong place. I did the wrong thing. God wouldn't want me to suffer. Here's a news flash from your Bible, full disclosure, 2 Timothy 3.12. Paul's telling young pastor Timothy, in fact, Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Yeah, that seems like a downer. But when you understand the value of being included in God's plan, of being given an assignment, you realize, ah, okay, it's worth it. When you understand the big picture of how God uses even our suffering to accomplish his plan, you have to, you have to believe that and accept that and understand that so that we can see and actually say, like Paul says here, hey, don't lose heart over what I'm suffering. It, it's totally worth it. We talked about it last week. When we see, our, see ourselves as strangers and aliens because we're citizens of heaven, uh, when we long for that heavenly home, then when we do suffer for others for the sake of the gospel, um, we go, it's totally worth it because I know what's at stake. So think about those loved ones that you're praying for. You're praying that they would know Christ and be saved. And ask yourself this, would it be worth it to suffer for Jesus if that person came to faith? I think so. I think so. And our text today helps us to see that it's worth it. Let me uh, pray. Well, God, thank you for this uh, bit of a... Um, uh, a side note in Paul's letter to the Ephesian church because we, are, we don't see suffering as part of your plan for us. But God, it was part of your plan for Jesus. And look what you accomplished through that. It was part of your assignment for Paul and you used it. God, uh, give us eyes to see, hearts to believe um, where our faithfulness and obedience to you might cause some suffering, Lord, and to say it's worth it. So thank you, Lord. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so it's totally
totally worth it, first of all, to play our part in God's plan. So let's uh, continue reading here in chapter 3. Uh, let's verse, read verses 1 to 5. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner uh, of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Skip to verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power to me. Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Okay, so Paul is he's giving us a little bit of his, his personal testimony here, some backstory to what has led to him being a prisoner for their sake. But it's not simply so that we'll feel better about his suffering. Paul is actually leading the way for us. He's he's modeling for us what faithfulness and what playing our part in God's plan might look like. I mean, Paul is often encouraging the churches to follow his example. So it's not just, I'll do it for you, you guys relax. He's like, come on, do what I do. 1 Corinthians 11.1, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Some translations say, be imitators of me. See, God doesn't have a plan B. His plan is to include us, to give us a part to play in accomplishing his mission. So just like Paul, by God's grace, we are first entrusted with the gospel. Okay, Paul, Paul was entrusted with the gospel. We are entrusted with the gospel Paul actually calls it a stewardship, an administration, or a responsibility, depending on your translation. You know, God is trusting us to protect the gospel, to be faithful to the gospel, to take seriously our responsibility as stewards of the gospel like like Paul. This is what he told the church in Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians 4. This, then, is how you ought to regard us. Okay, Paul was talking about himself and his little team of church planters. He said, we are servants of Christ. As those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now, it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. You know, some of you uh, have employees that you pay. They, they have a job to do. You're you're trusting them with responsibilities, maybe even with resources. And the expectation is that they will prove faithful. So God has given us this trust. We need to prove faithful. Every generation in the church has been given this responsibility to steward the gospel. It's a baton that has been passed down from generation to generation Um, And we've got the baton right now. And we need to be faithful when we get it and ensure that that baton gets passed to the next generation. This is what Paul was telling Timothy here in 2 Timothy 2. He said, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people faithful people who will also be qualified to teach others. Okay, we get that part of the job. Paul, thank you. We'll be faithful to do this. But he's like, wait, I'm not done. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Suffering, it's part of being faithful to the mission. There's no way to get around this. But we don't just endure it. 
we can actually rejoice in it. And this is what Paul said to the Colossian church. Colossians 1, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church for you all, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Are you, are you beginning to hear the same things here? What Paul is telling the church in Ephesus, he told the church in Colossae, he told the church in Corinth, he's telling the church in Philippi, he's trying to get the message across to us. Now in verse 7 of our chapter, Ephesians 3, Paul says he was made a minister of the gospel. A minister is not meant to be a professional title reserved for a select few. We're all ministers of the gospel. It simply means that, that we're servants for the gospel. And Paul says this is also a gift of God's grace. We, we don't deserve to be ministers of the gospel, but God's plan is to include us. Uh, it's to entrust the gospel to us. It is for us to serve others for the sake of the gospel. See, we just play our part. God is the one who brings the fruit. This is what he told the church in Corinth again, chapter 3. What, after all, is Apollos? That was one of Paul's team members here. What is Paul? We are only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord is assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God has been making it grow. So, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Okay, that's what Paul is talking about here in verse 7. God's power is what brings fruit and growth. But we need to play our part as stewards, as servants, and by God's grace as the third thing, heralds of the gospel. Look again at verse 8. He says, To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach. Preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to, to bring to light through that teaching, through that preaching, uh, what is the plan of the mystery? Hidden for ages in God who created all things. It is a humbling, it's an overwhelming privilege that we get to be heralds of the gospel. Paul felt this. Um, now you know, Paul actually changed his name uh, after he became a Christian. Do you remember what his birth name was? Saul. Okay, who's another Saul in the Bible? King Saul, the first king of Israel, and uh, Saul, the king of Israel, what does the Bible say? How tall was he? He was, he was a head taller than everybody else. I mean, that's, you stand in room, there he is, you know, he was a big guy, um, and he became king, and if you know the story, his his attitude was as big as his name. And I imagine Paul, who used to be Saul, had a similar attitude before he came to Christ. But when God called him, God humbled him. He didn't like what that name communicated anymore, so he changed his name to Paul. It's actually a Greek name. Um, and for his mission to the Gentiles. Do you know what the name Paul means? Anybody? Little. It means small. <laughs> See, Paul couldn't believe that God would give him this assignment of being an ambassador for Jesus, especially after what he had done. He persecuted the church. That's why he calls himself there in verse 8, the least of all the saints. This is what he tells the church in Corinth again. 1 Corinthians 15 says, I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle 
because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, and I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it's I or they, this, this is what we preach. This is what you believe. You may not feel worthy to tell people about Jesus. You may think that your past disqualifies you from being a minister or a herald of good news. Listen, no one had more shame about their past than Paul. No one. But God's grace, his undeserved favor, was greater than that. Paul was simply faithful with the gospel. Believe it or not, he was not a powerful, charismatic preacher. And he tells us that. Again, 1 Corinthians 2. Paul says, When I came to you, church, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. You don't don't have to be slick. I resolved, Paul says, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In fact, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom but on God's power. That is really good news for you and me. Really good news. The playing your part in God's plan is not about your power. It's not about your strength. It's not about your ability. It's simply resolving. I've decided I'm going to be a faithful steward. I'm going to be a faithful servant. I'm going to be a faithful herald of the gospel. Hear ye, hear ye. Okay? It's not my message. I'm bringing a message from the king. And it's good news. And it's totally worth it, secondly here, to share the mystery of the gospel. Let's read verse 6 that we skipped over. Paul says, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So Paul's just, he's just reiterating what he already told them in chapter 2, but, but it's worth it to say it again. Because the Ephesians, again, they weren't converted Jews. These were Gentiles. Uh, and they just, they needed a constant reminder that, do we really belong? Are, are we really in the family? And Paul's just reminding them here that by faith, anyone can be heirs with Christ. Anyone can be heirs with Christ. It's like Paul has to keep reminding the church that in Christ, they are now God's children, and they get all the rights, they get all the privileges of being God's children. Uh, Romans 8, 16 to 17 says this. I think we've got a slide for this. Is that not moving forward? Is it stuck? (laughs) There we go. Romans 8. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. What? We're children of God. And if we're children, then, then we're heirs. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. Paul's just got to throw this in. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. It comes with being in the family. Did anyone watch the coronation of King Charles or see the video or photos? We don't have any royal watchers in the room, do we? One. (laughs) I'm not a royal watcher either, but I saw some pictures, I saw some footage of it, and did you see his grandson is uh, Prince George? Prince George is maybe 10 years old. Uh, There you go. We got a royal watcher. (laughs) <laughs> yes, so oh, that's how you know. All right. Um, he got to hold his grandpa's cape. 
Okay, I mean, it's a lot of pomp and ceremony in, in, uh, in a coronation. Um, that cape that he was holding, George, one day will get to wear. After his father, William, is king, then George is next in line. See, George is an heir to the throne of Great Britain. You, however, you are an heir to the king of the universe. <laughs> and one of the responsibilities that comes with that privilege is suffering. Okay? You know, Paul just throws it in there just in case they forgot because we like to forget that, that little part of, of the, the job. But it's only for a season. Okay? Glory will last forever. And Paul reminds them, he's reminding us that by faith, not only can anyone be an heir with Christ, we can also, anyone can belong to God's family. Okay? Verse 6, the mystery of the gospel is that now in Christ, we are all members of the same body, the same family, the church. 1 Corinthians 12, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members are of the body, though many are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So, if you are feeling like different. I'm different from some of these people. I'm different from um, many of the people at, at church. That's actually a good thing. Okay? You bring something unique, uh, something that is needed, something that's important to the family. See, every member is needed. Every part of the body plays some important role we can't all be hands, we can't all be feet, we can't all be eyes. We have a unique part to play and contribute to God's plan. We don't deserve this, but by faith, anyone can also experience God's promises. Now, that could mean a lot of things there in verse 6. Partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. But at the very least, it refers to the gift of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. As Paul said in chapter 1, verse 13 there, that when we believed, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance. So one of the last things that uh, Jesus instructed his disciples before he ascended into heaven um, after his resurrection, was he told them to wait. Wait for him to send the Holy Spirit on them to empower them to play their part in God's plan. Um, Luke 24, 49 says, he tells them, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. So there's this promise that Jesus says, the Father has promised to give you his Holy Spirit, and I need you to wait uh, because you need that power. Now, this promise is for anyone who believes and trusts in Jesus, Jew, Gentile, anyone and everyone who has faith. And Paul rejoiced. Even if he had to suffer for the sake of this church and others so they could receive that promise. So they could experience God's promise. See, our diversity, our, our, our differences, when they actually come together uh, because of this mystery of the gospel, it, it's part of the wonder, part of the miracle of the body of Christ displaying God's wisdom to a watching world. So even though Paul suffering, it's totally worth it to do this, to display the wisdom of God.
totally worth it to display the wisdom of God. So let's read verses 10 to 13. Um, Paul says, Of this gospel I was made a minister, verse 10, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. So Paul's just saying, here's God's plan. This was God's purpose all along. His plan from before he created anything. He he already knew what he was going to do. And he decided in advance that he would display his wisdom by including us in his plan. So God does this first through the church. That's what verse 10 says explicitly. God is making his wisdom known through the church. Right? The, the way that we function as a local church is playing a critical part in God's plan. Right? We talked about it last week, chapter 2, verses 21 to 22, that the local church, we are a holy temple in the Lord. We're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the local church is way more important than how many people are treating it today. You cannot play your part in God's plan apart from a local church community. This is what Paul says to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 3. Don't you know? Don't you know that you yourselves, this is a, these are plural verbs. He's not talking about a person. He's talking about the church. You yourselves are God's temple. That God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred. And you together are that temple. Those are strong words. See, when when someone claims to be a follower of Jesus fails to participate in a local church by willfully choosing to not engage, to not come to worship, to not lean into fellowship, to not serve and use their unique gifts and calling to build up the body of Christ, when someone does that, and let's be honest, there are plenty of people today who call themselves Christians who are doing that right now. In some ways, what are they doing? They are destroying the temple that God intends for them to be a part of. They may not be setting out to destroy it, but they're, they're, they're destroying what God intended for the local church by not participating. The only way we can be this sacred temple is by what it says there at the end, doing it together. Why is this important? God is displaying his wisdom through the local church. So we have to be the church. But even more amazing, he's doing this to display his wisdom, second point here, to the angels and demons. It's what verse 10 says. He's making known his wisdom through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Okay, so that's referring to these spiritual beings that we call angels and demons. Okay, demons are actually fallen angels. So they're the same type of creature. And it's important for us to realize, listen, angels and demons are not God. Uh, They're not like God. Angels and demons don't know everything. Which means uh, they are watching God work out his plan, and they're actually learning. 
Now, they've had thousands of years <laughs> to watch and observe and learn what it is that God is doing. And frankly, they're often amazed, befuddled. They're just, wow, where did that come from? I, I can't believe what God is doing. How do we know that's true? Well, Peter talks about this. First Peter 1, he says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, uh, listen, they searched intently with the greatest care. You know, they, the, the Old Testament, the revelation that God had given them at that point, they were trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when, you know, these prophets were predicting the sufferings of the Messiah, and the glories that would follow. Um, it was revealed to those prophets that they were not serving themselves. They weren't going to see it. They were serving us in the future when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Okay, you're on the other side of the cross now, and the prophets could only see forward. You get to hear this good news. And then Peter says this, even angels long to look into these things. So, we are being watched by heavenly beings. Angels are watching us. Demons are watching us. And they are learning about God's ways as they watch how we play our part together. This is why doing church is so important. But it's also why it's so hard. See, Satan doesn't want God to be able to display his wisdom through us. So he actually opposes us at every turn. And we're going to get to that struggle in Ephesians 6, but... This is God's plan. This is, this is God's, he's going to do it through the church. He's, he's sending a message to the spiritual beings um, about his wisdom. And he's also doing a third thing here, for the sake of his glory. Whose glory is he doing this for? Certainly his glory. Okay, Paul tells us that several times in chapter 1, but amazingly, look at it. He is also doing this for our glory. He wants to share glory with us. Um, in Christ, chapter 2, verse 10, it says, we are God's handiwork, his workmanship, his masterpiece. So in Christ, everyone who has faith in Jesus, verse 22, you have access to God. You can confidently and boldly come to God as his dearly loved children. Hebrews 4.16 tells us this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, okay? so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God is not finished with his plan. He is still at work today. We are the ones holding the baton. Those who've gone before us, are cheering us on. Those who are going to come after us are counting on us to play our part faithfully. And Paul's reminding them, and he's reminding us, this is God's plan. And it's totally worth it to be included in his plan. It's totally worth it to share the mystery of his plan as his heralds. It's totally worth it to be able to display God's wisdom to all the spiritual beings in the universe, it's totally worth it. Even when playing our part results in suffering for us, even prison, even death. So when you hear about somebody who's paying a high price for their faithfulness to Jesus, Maybe it's a missionary story. Maybe it's um, someone who's in a very difficult part of the world and, and they're being persecuted. They're suffering because of the gospel. Don't feel sorry for them. They would probably tell you, no, no, rejoice. God has a purpose in this. 
when we suffer for him. We may not see it in the moment, but if we'll be patient, if we'll be faithful, we may see the fruit of it over time. Paul actually got to see this. Right? From the same prison there in Rome, he wrote another letter to the church in a town called Philippi in Greece. Um, they were concerned for Paul, just like the Ephesians. Um, oh, our Paul's in prison. What do we do? But here's what Paul told the Philippians. Okay, chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that that what has happened to me, and what is he talking about? Going to prison. These three to five years and the suffering he's endured. What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I want you to know this. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I mean, Paul's just like, hey, church, I want you to know some great news. It's unbelievable what God is doing. Four plus years of prison. And Paul is saying, totally worth it. Totally worth it. Raising children can be hard. Okay, moms, you're to be commended, uh, not just on Mother's Day, but every day. But many days, I imagine mothers ask themselves this question. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? But they keep going. They keep sacrificing. They keep giving. Why? Because they, they know it's worth it. They know it's worth it. So let's encourage a mom today. Uh, let's tell them it's worth it. Let's keep encouraging one another to play our part in God's plan. Amen? Let's pray. Hmm. Well, God, forgive us when we uh, are short-sighted, um, when we just want immediate gratification. We, we want um, to escape hardships that may actually be part of your plan um, for our lives. God, forgive us when we, we run from the lessons that you're teaching us, when we run from the training that you're giving us so that we and shine for you. God, thank you for moms who never gave up, who gave and gave, who may have even suffered for our good. Lord, help us to see whatever you call us to, if it does involve some pain and suffering, it's worth it. We know that you will be with us. We know that you are with us even in those moments and especially in those moments. So help us to cling to you, to be able to rejoice, to praise you, whatever our circumstances are. Fix our eyes on you. Even if it's a deep, dark valley, Lord, you are the one who leads us like a shepherd. Let's stand together.